A lot has changed in housing over the last few years, which makes you think, what might the way we live look like in the next few years? What about in 10 years? Or 20 years? 50? The pandemic has been a catalyst that has changed so much about where and how we decide to live. But what other pressures are changing our homes? And in particular, how we build them? Recent spate of disasters that we encountered, the bushfires, floods, droughts, buildings should be able to cope with extreme weather patterns and various kinds of changing environmental conditions. A future typical home will have to be adaptable to changing needs and that adaptability will be facilitated with integration of the physical sphere with the digital sphere. Currently, our houses need to cope with being not just the home, but being an office, being the school, being the recreation area, being the gym, <laughs> being everything pretty much. And future of homes will significantly move towards industrialized construction in the near future. They may take the form of Lego type of construction, that is preformed large components that are brought to site and assembled on site. What it brings about is ability to manufacture at scale. We need to find ways of bringing in highly efficient production mechanisms, lowering the capital cost, improving health and safety, reducing wastage, faster construction, and making sure that the end product is net zero carbon buildings. Modern society and younger generations specifically are more conscious about the environment. They are conscious about sustainability. And therefore, buildings need to represent those ideals. Hi, I'm Lisa and this is Steve and we're here at our home in Kai Valley. It's been built sustainably and off-grid. We produce all our own power here through the solar panels and the battery backup system. We also incorporated lots of recycled materials. We, over the years leading up to the build, we went on lots of road trips and adventures <laughs> gathering all sorts of recycled materials which you will see throughout the house. The passive build of the house, you know, that we've done obviously with a lot of double glazing, making use of the sun in winter, you know, coming through the double glazing and hitting the burnished concrete floors, which then acts as a thermal mass, which during the winter months releases heat once the sun goes down to sort of naturally heat the house. And I just couldn't understand why those really simple scientific principles that could be employed to harness the power of nature for free couldn't be combined with traditional inexpensive build methods and I really decided that we should rewrite the playbook on how to build a, an affordable sustainable home. People ask us all the time what do you go without or do you have to change your lifestyle because you live off grid? No. <laughs> we, we live in our home like anybody else lives in their home. So, and we have four children, three of whom are teenagers. We have everything that every other household has and our renewable power system just works. I see no reason why this isn't the way every home would be built in the future. So in the future, we can expect more modular homes built out of sustainable materials, built to last for life. But there's a big threat to the way we build homes we haven't talked about yet. So how we live in our homes is going to be subject to quite a bit of change as the impacts of climate change actually become more prevalent. So we're going to be seeing more extended heat days, we're going to see extreme events like the flooding that we've recently seen in New South Wales and Queensland. There's more than likely going to be things like bushfires and then we're also going to see the effects over time of sea level rise. And at the moment there seems to be a lack of disclosure of where these likely risky areas to habitate might be. And so what we might find if we go and purchase a house and then 
go to get a mortgage. Mortgage requires us to have that property insured and then we find out that the property is either uninsurable or it's going to cost an exorbitant amount to insure the property, maybe because of flooding or bushfire possible events. So we're going to need to think about where we have our development and our housing, and then what type of housing is going to be most resilient to these conditions in the future. If you start building projects that are actually demonstrating to be more resilient, more energy efficient, more resource efficient, and still managing to provide that sense of home, that sense of community, that's what's going to drive that market. And that's what's going to engage consumers to actually make those choices and want to purchase those types of homes. Nine out of 10 Australians are concerned about sustainability and only half believe they are making the necessary changes to improve the situation. Sustainability will be a big factor in the way we build into the future, but what are some of the factors that will change our home life? In 1856, Australians won the right to work an eight hour workday, an achievement that permanently changed the way we live and how we interact with our home. Fast forward to the 2020s, and we may have seen a change that is equally as lifestyle changing in the way we interact with our homes. The global pandemic has forced us to reevaluate our lifestyle. How is the way we use our home changing and going to change into the future? Homes are changing, first of all, uh, and people are changing. And uh, the way we inhabit houses and neighborhoods uh, are changing themselves. Families still matter a lot, but Australians are perhaps more single or in different setups uh, in terms of who lives in houses. And space uh, is less about having more space and it's more about having more flexible space because, for instance, people have uh, multiple jobs or wildly differing uh, hobbies uh, and different things that they do on a daily basis. But at the same time, uh, there has been a push for localization and relocalization of lifestyles, uh, even before the, the pandemic crisis. So return to thinking about the importance of your neighborhood, your community, the most accessible and closest uh, green space, uh, the availability of food, and at the same time, your home space matters as well, but all those things are calling for flexibility uh, and accessibility. My name's Chris, I'm recently retired. This is my bolt hole in the city, Sydney. It's positioned for access to everything, whether it's bus lines, whether it's masses of restaurants, theatre, cinema, parks. Whereas where I live in the country, you know, you've got to jump in the car and to do anything, you've got to either take a bus or drive. I've always had a small apartment in the city to visit family and friends and wanted something that primarily had a balcony where I have coffee every morning even if it's raining and it's got a stunning outlook over the harbour. This is a very compact, functional, easy to navigate space, uh, certainly small enough. When the bed's up it's a very relatively sizable space. Every space, every inch of space is, has a purpose. I'm very interested in function over form. It, it forces you to be very disciplined about what you actually need. And when you're sort of living in a modern way, you actually don't need a lot. You know, maybe we need a better mentality about turning things over. Environmentally, recycling, that's a good thing but constantly consuming is not a good thing. You know, we, we acquire way too much. Simpler, more intentional and flexible homes may become the norm, but what about living smarter, like being able to flush the toilet from another room, or having your morning coffee delivered to you in bed by your personal robot? We all know about the connected home trend, but how smart can our homes really get in the coming decades? Our homes are very much going to do the same things in the future, it's just going to be easier to do it. Your house is going to learn things as you go, and that's not a scary thing, it's not learning about you, it's learning your pattern. So uh, taking things into account like temperature, the time of day, how hot it is, the wind speed, and then enacting changes based on those things so that you don't have to do it. We'll also see the smart home technology have a bearing on our energy management. So if the sun's blaring, we're generating a lot of electricity, um, that's the times we might run the pump and the air conditioning a little bit harder. But a typical house might have have security, CCTV, air conditioning control, some lighting control, uh, access for doors and locks. We're not 
changing the way humans behave in their house, we're just giving an easier way to control it uh, and in doing so give flexibility to the home. This is our home, standard, not so standard, family home made for us to live our everyday lives in. We wanted something that looked great but was also extra functional. I mean, it, it, we've got this easiest things from CCTV that can be viewed from anywhere in the world. Um, I can see whether my gardens have been watered, I can check what my um, wine cellar temperatures, air conditioning, anywhere we have a data connection we can literally see what is going on within our home. From a safety standpoint, you know, we've got kids, um, we've got cats that are indoor cats and they're not allowed to get out. So within the home there's a lot of sensors on doors and windows. If a front door, for example, has been left open for longer than a, a defined period of time, we start hearing either a beep or an alert will come to our phone, same with the gates. We can also jump onto an app and it has indicators of you know, whether windows are open or closed, garage doors open or closed. Um, and so you can get a quick read on how the house is sitting security wise um, at any given time. Kids wake up at night time, I walk across the bridge, the bridge lights turn on nice and low so I can see, but not enough to startle. We've included a, a water feature off the top of the ceiling over the pool. Press the button, put the timer on for 15 minutes, pool's filled up, done. No hoses, nothing, and it just looks beautiful and it's there for purpose. Being able to be in a comfortable space, you know, the AC set properly, things like that, just senses to be able to know before you know that things might not be right, so it's comfort. Some predict the average Australian household will add more than 10 connected devices by 2025, and more than half Australian homes will be smart or connected by 2041. But let's zoom out a little. What can we expect our cities to look like? There are 10 million homes in Australia, and by 2041, there could be 13 million. How will our societies and the structure of our communities change? In the future, as Australia's population grows, there are a few things we'll see. First, we're likely to see more urban sprawl away from cities. Secondly, we're likely to see increased densification within our cities. When we see more people come to an area, we see increased demand for not just houses, but things like retail amenity, cafes, shops, gyms, exercise facilities. All of these things are really appealing to people when deciding where to live and help to drive what we would call gentrification. When an area becomes more desirable, competition for housing increases and that drives up prices and rents. One of the challenges that comes with gentrification is that we often see locals priced out of their own communities. On the other hand though, new development can revitalise a neighbourhood. It can alleviate social issues, it can promote safe areas with new shopping and service supply, and it can certainly produce new housing stock for people who can afford it. So we need to ask ourselves, in what ways is gentrification benefiting existing and future residents, but also what is it costing them? Australians still continue to leave major cities in larger numbers than ever. So how do these geographical trends affect what our cities and population centres might look like? Australia is an urban country, it's a country of cities. Latest count, which is already a bit old and probably much bigger, uh, 18 million in cities, 4 million in the countryside. But there isn't just the city, the city of Melbourne and the countryside. Australia is a, is, is a country of metropolitan and large urban spaces. So if anyone wants to think about the future of Australian cities, we need to think about the future of Australian city systems or constellation of cities. A trend we're really seeing starting to emerge are satellite cities that are drawing more people in. As more people move to these satellite cities, opportunities for employment growth, demand for retail grows, and we start to see this gentrification happening. The regional areas that are most likely to undergo gentrification are those that are within about a one to two hour driving distance from a capital city. These are the towns that are really going to be the satellite cities of the future. We're at the Paddock Eco Village project in Castlemaine, comprising 27 houses and a community centre. Um, and in the middle is the whole area of food growing. The houses are all 8.5 stars. Here with the solar, we're exporting more than people use. So we're actually carbon neutral here. So if you want to be carbon neutral, it's helped along by building projects 
like this. All future housing should be like this. It's easy to do. You can just cut down in a society, in a community like this. You don't have to have 20 lawn mowers, you can have one. We all struggle to find what we can do about climate change because we're all, we just think, oh well, you know, if I cut down my little bit of waste or I take my bicycle, is it really making a difference? We're hoping that this is so that others can learn from it. What we're most excited about is that if other developers can learn from it. It is true that we, to create a better world and use less energy, you need developments like this. A small, sustainable community could be the perfect way to live for some of us. But some of us love the culture of the big city. And even if your home is smarter than you are, a home still has basic needs. And those homes of the future need shared infrastructure to support them. Well, Kinley is going to be a suburb of the future. We're taking an old quarry, 163 hectare site, and we're turning it into a modern, connected, master-planned, integrated community where we're trying to incorporate a whole bunch of new innovations, new ways of thinking, also technology, into what is a very large place. Kinley has just been accredited as a six-star, green-star community, which is considered world-leading. We've actually made the inclusion of solar power mandatory for every single house, which means you have to rethink the way the entire grid is developed. It's really important that you also have fantastic connectivity in terms of not just roads, but active transport links. So it becomes more convenient for people to walk around or use a bike or an e-bike or an e-scooter rather than relying on jumping in the car. But ultimately it's about, I think, creating efficiency. It's efficiency in time and it's efficiency in energy use. And for us, it's everything from uh, if you're taking the train or the bus, you get a smart notification telling you where it is so you don't have to waste your time waiting at the stop. Uh, you might leave when it's a bit dark and so you might have smart lighting in place which is designed to stay low when no one's around to try and reduce light pollution but the moment you're on the path it starts to light up and lights up where you're going. Automatic uh, counting of uh, traffic, of pedestrians, you can give data to retailers to understand where the high volume periods are so you can you know, set up their uh, staff to work at the right times as well. You know, I think that it comes down to having the right base infrastructure but especially when you're talking about decade-long projects like this, it's about having the flexible underpinnings because just think about how much technology has changed over the last decade. It's very hard to predict exactly what they'll be in, in 10 years time but whatever it is you know it'll work well as long as you create that right underlying infrastructure from day one. We always talk about the smart city or the connected city as a future thing uh, and first and foremost I think one of the problems is it's already here. Your, most of our cars already talk to our phones. Uh, most of our phones talk to each other even without us knowing. And already shapes uh, um, the optimization of services, the way people behave. So something really cool would be able to go from home to work without ever spotting a car or walking across a six lane uh, street packed with honking beasts. And that sounds so low tech, but it might be the way we manage our lives in the future versus flying cars uh, and uh, bottles delivered by drones. All them. If we've learned anything recently, it's that what we need out of a home is ever changing. In 1856, it was a big win to get a couple of extra hours at home each day. But in 2022, you might find yourself at home all the time. As our homes and cities get smarter, and the role of the home changes over time, we learn that we're not bound by what a home is today. And that with so many options and innovations available, you can truly make a home both yours today, and of course, into the future.